Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. We are very excited uh, to have uh, Dr. Roger Lee and Dr. Brandon Mangley, uh, who are going to talk about um, the great things, uh, the wonderful things we're doing uh, regarding bladder and kidney cancer, advancing the science the research uh, to improve our treatments for those two uh, cancers. Next slide. Um, it's important to know that the content uh, of this presentation is not intended to be medical advice and the viewer should consult their physicians should they have any questions. The viewer should not re rely on information contained in this presentation webinar for immediate or urgent medical needs. Additionally, if you think you may have a medical emergency, call your physician, go to the nearest emergency department or call 911 immediately. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care because of information contained in this presentation webinar. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Roger Lee, who is going to um, uh, talk about uh, some exciting things going on uh, with bladder cancer. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us this evening for an exciting talk. Um, you know, uh, so my name is Roger Lee. I'm a urologic oncologist here at Moffitt. And tonight I have the privilege of talking to you a little bit about how we uh, treat bladder cancer and also some of the really exciting projects that we have ongoing here at Moffitt. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, I want to emphasize that we are truly at the crossroads of a very exciting time um, for bladder cancer research. And the reason why I say that is because there truly is an unmet need in this field because uh, I see actually a lot of my patients on the call. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Bladder cancer is a very deadly disease. And because of a lack of funding over the years, there really hasn't been that much advancements over the last few decades. And when you know the, the, um, the federal government had looked into whether or not we had moved the needle on bladder cancer care, they found that bladder cancer, unfortunately, is one of those diseases that hasn't really made too many advancements over the last few years. Um, here at Moffitt, we do take care of a lot of patients, which you know, we'll talk about the specific numbers here in a few slides. And finally, we're also building a really robust research program here at Moffitt that can tackle the problems that we see in bladder cancer and use the experience that we have in taking care of these patients and also um, the research uh, that we've conducted using the, the tissue samples that we've collected from our generous donors to, to further understand the disease in order to come up with better treatments and better ways of diagnosis. Next. And next slide. So uh, just as background, um, there's over 81,000 uh, new cases that are diagnoses, di diagnosed in the United States every year. And um, just under 7,000 of those cases are diagnosed each year here in Florida. And as you can see there, it's truly a very deadly disease with just under 1,500 deaths happening here in Florida. Next. So, I want to, this to kind of sink in a little bit. So here, just at Moffitt Cancer Center, we treat over 10% of the Floridian bladder cancer patients every year. Uh, radical cystectomy is a surgery in which we actually surgically remove the bladder and also recreate the urinary tract. And of those, we do over 200 a year. And at Moffitt, we're also at the forefront of immunotherapy and cell therapy uh, treatments, uh, not only for this disease, but also for other types of cancer. Next. So um, many of you are familiar with this, but bladder cancer is thought to originate from the uh, surface of the bladder. And as the disease advances, uh, the tumor actually progressively gets deeper into the wall of the bladder. And we actually depend on how deep the cancer invades into the bladder as staging for the disease to 
prognosticate to see how aggressive the disease is and how likely it is that it can be completely eradicated versus needing to have additional treatments. Next. So the, the management paradigm for bladder cancer starts with prevention, um, next, and screening of the cancer um, in, in patients who doesn't have any symptoms of the disease. Um, once it's found, we have to diagnose that the, make the diagnosis by doing a cystoscopy procedure where we insert a camera inside the bladder to confirm the existence of the cancer and also by scraping out the cancer in order to stage how deeply it invades into the wall of the bladder. Next. And then depending on how deep it invades into the wall of the bladder, we then give the patients either intravesical treatment with medicine infused inside the bladder, definitive treatment, surgical removal of the bladder, or systemic treatment, which is chemotherapy or immunotherapy that's administered throughout the body. Next. And of course, all of these treatments and diagnoses are made in conjunction between the urologist, the radiation oncologist, and also the medical oncologist. Next. So where are the gaps that we have currently in bladder cancer? Um, next. So the first one is inaccurate staging. The bladder is sort of like a balloon. And when we scrape out these tumors, we really scrape out uh, the, the, the tumors, try not to pop the balloon, if you will. And you can imagine how difficult that becomes sometimes when actually the tumor may be infiltrating through the wall of the bladder. So this makes staging very difficult when we don't sample deep, into, uh, deep enough into the wall of the bladder. Next. And of course, um, you know, when there's inaccurate staging and sometimes there could be misaligned treatment because there's a lot of different types of bladder cancer that sometimes will respond differently to different types of therapy. So we also have to, you know, understand ways to align the treatment along with the cancer itself. Next. So one of the ways that we have tried to improve upon our staging is by examining mutations within the tumor, cell, uh, the tumor cells themselves, but also because bladder cancer is bathed in urine, oftentimes we can actually find these cancer uh, DNA within the urine itself. So here, I just want to kind of show the panel of the types of mutations that are found in the tissue and the panel on the far left there. And in the middle, the same uh, sort of mutations are found within the urine. So you can imagine we can actually leverage the urine as a surrogate diagnosis for the cancer itself. Next. So by using these urine tests, we can first detect whether anybody has cancer or not in the bladder. Next. We can also improve upon the staging. Next. We can track whether or not the cancer is responding to the treatments that we're giving. And next. And finally, we can also predict whether or not each cancer is going to react uh, against the treatment that we're given. Next. So by leveraging these urinary tests, you can imagine we have a group of patients with bladder cancer. Next. We can take their tumors along with their urine. Next. And we can actually use the urine to profile how aggressive the tumor is. Next. And for the patients that uh, are not even diagnosed with the cancer, we can use the urine to diagnose that they do have cancer, next. And for those tumors that are not very aggressive, we can actually use some sort of treatment uh, and help the patient to preserve their bladders. And finally, for the most aggressive tumors, we can take these patients um, straight to surgery to remove the bladder in order to prevent the cancer from progressing on beyond the bladder, next. Um, another example of a very exciting um, new treatment that we're offering here at Moffitt is a, a clinical trial that we're currently conducting using an oncolytic virus that actually directly detects the cancer cells, kills the cancer cells, and in the process also release these proteins that are very specific to the cancer cells so that the immune system can latch on to the tumor-specific uh, proteins then generating an immune response. Um, 
this trial is ongoing. We're uh, aiming to enroll 30 patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer and treating it with this very specific regimented uh, therapy that's uh, unavailable anywhere else in the world. And with this uh, combination, we're actually seeing very, very promising early results um, that in this pa patient population who would otherwise not have any other options of systemic therapy, we're seeing results that are on par with the standard of care for muscle invasive bladder cancer, which is chemotherapy that's administered prior to the radical cystectomy. Next slide. And so uh, this is a, a slide that kind of uh, explains the mechanism, but essentially, again, the oncolytic virus will release the tumor antigens or the proteins that are uh, related to the cancer cells. It will attract or bring in a lot of the immune cells to the microenvironment of the tumor, and the immune cells will then attack the cancer cells by latching onto these proteins that are only found in the cancer cells. Next. And interestingly enough, we're also doing a lot of uh, uh, very exciting research on the, the tumor specimens that we're collecting in these uh, patients. And from these tumor specimens, we're actually detecting these lymph node-like structures in the tumor samples that um, in patients who eventually go on to have response. And so we think that this may be a, a biomarker or a predictor for a good response to this type of treatment. So, you know, I hope that uh, within the last few slides that I gave you just a taste of some of the exciting research that we're doing. And we're really hoping that all of these research will be able to um, come to fruition and to make, to move the needle in the management of bladder cancer. I'd like to thank you very much and uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Manley. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lee. So uh, my name is Dr. Manley. I am a partner with uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Pao Sang, and I'm also a uh, GU oncologist here at Moffitt Cancer Center. So, um, you know, half my time I spend taking care of patients in the clinic. The other half, uh, I'm afforded the ability to do some research uh, here at Moffitt Cancer Center, and, and much of my research is in kidney cancer. So I'd like to share with you just briefly some of the uh, advances we've made recently. Um, so this slide sort of demonstrates that within the last four years, sort of around the time that I arrived, um, not just myself, but others, uh, a lot, a big team here at Moffitt have been successful in publishing some of our work in some of the highest impact journals in our field. We've also been successful in securing funding from some of the major re uh, resources that fund uh, medical research, including the NCI, the Department of Defense, the state of Florida, along with some of the associations that help support our work, including the American Urology Association and the Kidney Cancer Association. Next slide. So this gives you sort of a, a quick overview of many of the ongoing projects we have. Certainly don't have time to talk about them all here. Uh, the, uh, one of the, well, two of them, I'll sort of give you a little bit more detail uh, involved in them. Um, next slide. So the first one is uh, looking at sort of the spatial immune cell patterns in kidney cancer, what we call RCC. So that's the acronym we use. Uh, it's very common in, in much of uh, medical and especially uh, surgical and cancer where we take samples of tumors, right? And we look under the slide to try and get more information about them. what type are they? Are they aggressive? Are they not aggressive? Uh, there's a wealth of information in that, that data. And typically we use sort of some more, I guess you would say rudimentary metrics to sort of measure, okay, are these aggressive tumors or not aggressive tumors? One of the things more recently in the last decade or so, not just in kidney cancer, in many cancers, we're starting to say, okay, yes, there's tumor cells there, but we also want to look at the immune cells there. With the advent of a lot of treatments with immunotherapy, it's become much more apparent that there's a dynamic that goes on between the tumor in a patient's own immune system and how those dynamics change or shift over the course of a patient's disease can also give us insight into how a patient may either respond to treatment or be at risk of recurrence and stuff like that. Much of this work has been focused on using some, again, sort of rudimentary metrics like density, right? How many cells do we see within a, a period of space? But you can take some more novel approaches to measuring different dynamics. And one of these projects is looking at uh, the space between or the distance between different immune cells. And you can relate that to 
different immune cells like T cells or B cells or macrophages. But you can also do that in looking at how it relates to the tumor, whether it's in the center of the tumor or sort of at the interface, we call it, or more in the stroma, so the, the normal tissue surrounding it. And this is a project that has been led by Dr. Chakirian, who's one of our excellent fellows and in collaboration with Dr. Altrock, who's a, a mathematician who studies the oncology. And we looked at some of the more common immune cells that we see in the human body. And again, these were studied under the microscope using multiplexing uh, to look at all of these cells at once to see how they change across different patients, different kidney tumors, and how those affect patients' outcomes and results. Next slide. So again, this is sort of your standard H&E slide, we call it, um, that many pathologists use. Um, and again, this is sort of, you're looking on the right side there, the clearer part, that's the tumor, and the more dense side, the more purple side on the left is the stroma. And there's a lot more going on here than just these stains are showing us. Next slide. Like I said, there, there's often, you know, the battle between, I guess you could say good and evil, right? The tumor wants to grow out, the tumor or the, the host wants to keep the tumor at bay, right? And what are those predicting factors that say, okay, the tumor is gonna win or it's gonna win really quickly, right? It's gonna spread, or this may be a more indolent disease that we don't really necessarily have to do anything too aggressive for. Next slide. So you can look and see if these little blue cells, right? Uh, are these tumor cells sort of more clustered um, in the, the, or are these immune cells more clustered in the tumor, which would be on the right, next slide? Or are they more on the stroma side? Next slide. Or are they sort of just randomly distributed throughout with really no pattern or recognition? One way that we can sort of measure this is, is using actually some mathematical uh, work that is typically done in ecology, right? So when ecologists go out to measure how many, you know, different animal types are within a region, they can't literally cover, you know, hundreds of square miles, right? So they, they have a, a method that they use to try and estimate within certain distances or radii how much of a certain animal type is there. And you can actually take that same math and apply it to tumor cells. It's obviously just at a much smaller scale. Next slide. So with this project, what we're able to show is, so this is a marker CD162 for macrophages. And at the bottom here, you can see stage, but that as stage advance, right? Tumors get more advanced with stage four being metastatic that you see a shift in this clustering, right? This affinity for these macrophages to tumor cells to sort of shift, okay? Next slide. If you were to take, again, one of the more rudimentary ways where we just say density, how many of these cells do you see? These CD163 densities actually don't tell you the same story. So we're getting different and new information by measuring things differently than we had before. Next slide. And what you can do with this information is you can actually digitize it, right? You can take a slide that, you know, I showed in one of the slides before, but you can actually create these plots, right? Point pattern plots that give us much finer details so that we can study sort of some of these patterns, right? That tell us a lot more about tumors than sort of what meets the eye. And next slide. One of the analogies I sort of give, right, is, is much of us, many of us are more familiar with QR codes, but if I show you a QR code, you probably couldn't tell me what it means, right, or what website it links to, but you have an app on your phone that can, right, so at some point we can get these point pattern plots to be recognized by machines, right, by machine learning algorithms to sort of give us or pathologists, your physicians, more information than, again, we typically get from a slide, and this can be used in a myriad of ways to affect either how we manage patients, determine what treatments they get, whether it's immunotherapy or combination therapy. Uh, and so it's a way for us to, again, get better prognostics, biomarkers, and all of that great stuff to help improve patient outcomes. Next slide. And lastly, one of the other things, again, that we sort of leverage here at Moffitt is we have a really strong oncology program. And we know that in, in typically treatment in many cancers, and kidney cancer is one of them too, that especially when patients develop metastatic disease, we treat them with systemic therapy basically to try and eradicate their disease. Unfortunately, we know for most patients, at least in kidney cancer, that doesn't work, right? Eventually, the tumor evolves. It develops resistant mechanisms. So one of the more novel way to approach this, and we've been doing this in prostate cancer for a while and are proposing to do it in kidney cancers and several others, is to say, okay, listen, it may be in inevitable that if you maximally sort of try and kill every cancer cell, that some of them go on to develop resistance. But naturally, if you're not doing anything, the cancer cells are actually fighting amongst themselves for resources, blood supply, nutrients, and things like that. 
and you have some of them that are going to be susceptible to your drug and you have some who aren't but those ones can actually compete with each other to sort of keep things in equilibrium so to speak so this is a trial where we say okay listen we want to treat patients when they need treatment but there may be a point where we can stop treatment for at least a period of time and let those sort of cells that can compete with the resistant cells but are susceptible to our treatment sort of grow back so that they can sort of keep things at bay or hemostate, uh, uh, you know, some kind of equilibrium, right, that, that allows them to sort of fight amongst themselves and not be so concerned about growing and spreading. Additionally, this has the added benefit of, of limiting toxicities to patients. Many of the drugs we give, and especially in advanced cancer, come with risk and side effects. And so for some patients, these sort of treatment holidays, which again, can be anywhere from a couple months to maybe potentially a couple of years in some patients can also bring a lot of benefit to patients. And so this evolution of sort of an adaptive approach instead of like, hey, let's fire all of our cannons right now, but more of a precise, like here's where we're gonna do something, here's where we're gonna take a break, has been shown in other, other cancers to be effective and, and beneficial to patients in many ways. And, and this is something we're currently looking at uh, setting up a clinical trial here in kidney cancer to, based on the same principles. Next slide. And so that's all I got. So I'll turn it back over to Dr. Pelsing. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Brandon. Great presentations. Um, I want to open it now uh, for the participants. Uh, if uh, there are any questions, I've seen some questions through the chat that Dr. Lee had already responded to. I think there was a question in the chat uh, regarding the difference between the treatment with BCG which is a medication that is put into the bladder uh, as compared to the treatment that Dr. Lee was mentioning with the oncolytic virus. Can you expand on that, uh, Roger? Absolutely. Um, so thank you for that question. And BCG is a medicine that we very commonly use for um, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And it's sort of like a carpet bomb, if you will. It activates a lot of different mechanisms within the immune system to attack the cancer cells. But we do know that oftentimes, you know, a lot of patients will not respond to BCG and will develop recurrence after uh, BCG is given. So what we've developed is a new drug that's a smart bomb that detects only the cancer cells called an oncolytic virus. And in the process of detecting and destroying the cancer cells, it also releases, um, as I explained earlier, some proteins that are specific to the cancer cells that then generates an immune response directed, again, specifically at the cancer cells. And so what we found with, uh, a, in a novel um, Im immunotherapy trial using this drug and also with immune checkpoint blockade is that this drug combination has been working great in BCG, what are called BCG unresponsive patients, um, whose typical uh, course of treatment would involve actually the surgical removal of their bladders and the reconstruction of their urinary tract. So you can imagine a really life altering treatment, but with this drug combination, we're actually seeing really great results and we're helping a lot of patients to keep their bladders um, and to also be disease-free at the same time. And as Dr. Uh, Palsane had mentioned, and also, you know, I had also uh, presented in my earlier talk, we're also using this combination in the, in, for muscle invasive bladder cancer patients in whom uh, usually the standard of care is cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And due to various different diseases, unfortunately, these patients cannot tolerate the cisplatin chemo. Uh, thus, you know, for them, the really uh, only option is to go directly to uh, the radical cystectomy or surgical removal of the bladder. And unfortunately, uh, for these patients, the results are not great. So we're also using this drug combination, which is a lot less toxic than chemotherapy. And a lot of the patients have been tolerating it great. And it also requires less time um, than the, the typical course for chemotherapy. And again, we're discovering that this combination of drug 
is working very, very well in these patients, oftentimes reducing the cancer to not detectable at the time of the radical cystectomy. So from this trial, these couple of trials were generating a lot of positive results and also a lot of excitement, as you can imagine, for patients with BCG unresponsive disease who would otherwise lose their bladders, but also patients who have um, you know, traditionally not received uh, adequate treatment for their muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, so we're very excited to, to further develop these and hopefully bring it to the clinic um, for more patients who are in need. Thank you, Roger. Um, there was a question here related to kidney cancer. Um, a, the question is, uh, how do you share your research in renal cell cancer uh, with urologists and oncologists beyond what is reported in uh, journal clubs? Um, the patient shares his experience that he had kidney cancer 18 years ago and uh, was told that um, he didn't have to come for a follow-up. Uh, but uh, then he presented with a recurrence um, 18 years later with tumor in the pancreas. So how do you um, uh, inform um, urologists, medical oncologists, primary care physicians in the community about these newer things that are coming uh, out related to kidney cancer and the appropriate way of following these patients? Uh, do you want to take this, Brandon? Sure. So yes, uh, journal articles are still the mainstay for how us in medicine communicate both novel research, uh, interesting findings. So I don't think that's going away anytime, but there's certainly more opportunities in this day and age, uh, social media, Twitter, uh, Facebook, YouTube, um, all of those are becoming more and more uh, ways that we disseminate information just like any other information. You know, when it comes more to a personal level with the patient, I think we all here at Moffitt will almost always reach out or either phone or email to whoever the referring provider is, either to clarify things or to make a plan clear. You know, certainly uh, we have the opportunity here at Moffitt to focus solely on cancer, um, which allows us to sort of really study and try and keep things up to date. But we know other providers may have, you know, they, they deal with a lot of other diagnoses that aren't cancerous. And so it's hard to stay up on that uh, kind of information. So communication is a big factor in that. Um, you know, there's always going to be new advances, both in bladder and kidney and in many other cancers. So staying up to date on that is, you know, no pun intended, a full-time job. Um, and so part of our job is obviously, well, the biggest part is taking care of patients, but we certainly do lots of um, things such as these webinars. We go out to local communities to try and give talks about these kind of things to make local providers and patients too uh, knowledgeable about things that are available and things that maybe we don't have here. You know, some of these rare, unique clinical trials, uh, ones like I was talking about proposing and like Dr. Lee's study, you know, are unique here, but we know there's other cancer centers that may have opportunities. And we think that's what's best for patients and it's available for them. That's our job is to communicate that information. Thank you, Brandon. Um, there's a follow-up question here. Um, if you could um, think uh, on the main advances in renal cell carcinoma in the last decade, uh, what do you think uh, would those be? The biggest one is immunotherapy. I mean, immunotherapy has changed the game for a lot of cancers and kidney cancer is actually one of the early ones that showed some of the most promising results. You know, um, it used to be just even 10 years ago, we only had very few drugs and they were pills that we still use from time to time. But now with immunotherapy, we now have over seven different combination therapies. We see survival rates that we never saw before patients are living longer, you know, unfortunately, it's still not a disease where we talk about cure, but some of that has to do with we haven't had long enough time to find out how many patients we are curing. So that has changed uh, dramatically. And more recently, last couple months, there's approval now for adjuvant immunotherapy, which again, is, is something we've never been able to offer patients before. Um, I certainly envision that more and more, we will figure out which patients are the right patients to give this treatment to earlier and earlier in their disease course. Certainly one of the things we all know about cancer is the best way to beat cancer is never to get it, right? And so there may be ways, again, we're not talking about total prevention because we don't know all the things that cause kidney cancer, unlike you know bladder cancer, which has some link to smoking or has a very strong link to smoking. 
Um, but th there may be a way to treat patients earlier in their disease before they actually develop metastatic, you know, metastasis to all over the body. Thank you, Brandon. Let me pause for a minute, and I wanted to introduce uh, David Curry from the foundation, and um, he's going to say a few words. Uh, so, David, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Pao Sang. Appreciate, uh, appreciate that. And, and to everybody who's here tonight uh, with us, we're going to get back to the Q&A in just a moment. We're getting a lot of really good questions. And I just wanted to mention the fact that if we don't get all of those answered tonight, uh, we will follow up with you and we will uh, get the appropriate answers and share those with you. So, so keep asking the questions and we'll get back to that in just a moment. I also want to um, thank uh, Stacy Price, one of my colleagues, uh, she's the one, these webinars don't happen uh, overnight. She's been working on this for about eight to 10 weeks. And so she's doing a great job. She's being supported tonight also by another of my colleagues, Tiffany Hughes. So I just wanted to, to thank them for, for the good work they're doing. My role in the foundation and as the partner to the GU program is to find support for the, these projects that you're hearing about tonight and, and other projects that come up. Uh, a lot of that is done with private philanthropy. And I know that um, several of you on the, on the webinar tonight are already supporting the GU program and supporting uh, uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Manley. I wanna thank you for that. The rest of you, uh, some of you might have an interest in doing that, exploring ways that you can uh, support this important work. Uh, th they're really pushing the boundaries of, of their research and they're accelerating a lot of um, techniques a, a lot of ways to really increase the, the outcomes that are better for patients. And so uh, not just at Moffitt, but around the world. So um, if you have any uh, idea that you'd like to explore a way to support this work, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and um, we'll see if we can make that happen. Thanks again for joining us. You have a lot of options tonight and you chose to join us. Uh, so we appreciate that very much. So uh, Dr. Pal saying back to the Q&A. Thank you, David. Um, there's a question here for Dr. Lee. Uh, I am a BCG a cancer survivor. Um, I had uh, salvage radiation therapy. Um, last system was clear. Um, and if the cancer comes back, are there any trials uh, that I would be available to participate in? Absolutely. So, you know, it really will depend on the specific scenario um, in your situation uh, once if the tumor were to come back and hopefully it doesn't. Um, but, uh, you know, depending on the staging of the tumor and, um, you know, depending on how, uh, uh, you know, far removed you are from your radiation treatments, there certainly will be options for clinical trial opportunities. Thank you, Roger. Another question for you. Um, do you have any data on upper tract urothelial carcinoma developing uh, one year after radical cystectomy? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, what we do know is that uh, urothelial cancer that develops in the upper tract after bladder cancer um, typically is of a sort of molecular classification that's um, termed basal tumors. And these tumors are thought to be very responsive to chemotherapy, um, but they on the surface will also be more aggressive than their counterparts, which, which are the luminal subtype of bladder cancers. Um, so I think it's gonna be very critical to treat that with preoperative or neoadjuvant um, chemotherapy first because once the kidney is removed, then of course we're gonna be losing kidney function um, uh, and sometimes may not be able to get cisplatin-based chemotherapy in that setting. Uh, but certainly, you know, the, the, uh, the gold standard treatment is going to be neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by ra radical nephrohydrectomy. Thank you, Roger. Um, there's a question uh, here Again, for Dr. Lee, uh, there's a patient who's taking Farsiga for a kidney um, failure. And uh, in the insert, there's a description that it might uh, lead to bladder cancer. Any comments? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, you know, but certainly, um, 
you know, that, that's not something that I've came across. Um, there is a question here again for um, Dr. Lee regarding um, the BCG and availability. Uh, there's been a difficult uh, time to get access to BCG. Um, how would you address that? So that's actually been a very tough, um, you know, scenario for us to navigate as a cancer center and also, of course, for a lot of our patients. And, you know, truly, um, we understand where you uh, are, your anxiety in this situation. Um, but, you know, I would want to assure you that as Moffitt Cancer Center is one of the biggest cancer centers in the United States and also in the world, we do have a privileged um, access to more BCG than some of our community counterparts. Um, and so we've been able to provide, uh, you know, BCG according to the SWA protocol um, up until very recently. And uh, unfortunately, we have recently been hit with the BCG shortage as well, which has um, caused us to kind of do some assessment on how best to administer the, the drug. And we've actually came together as a group um, to review the literature on uh, the B different types of BCG dosing regimen and also the different scheduling of the BCG regimen. And I can assure you that, you know, putting all of our minds together, uh, we've reviewed and are very well aware of the efficacy that's linked to every uh, sort of tested uh, BCG dosing protocol that there is. And, you know, based on that assessment, we have designed um, a, uh, a prioritization scheme um, to to dole out the BCGs, you know, first to the patients who most need it, and also to the patients that BCG will most likely um, uh, have the most impact on your cancer. So I can assure you that, you know, first of all, we are doing our best in giving all of our patients uh, access to BCG, but also prioritizing it in, in a scientifically backed way such that, you know, we are getting the most bang for the buck, if you will. Um, so, uh, you know, with that being said, I still uh, certainly understand um, the conundrum that sometimes comes with this situation. And we're also looking to develop other drugs um, that can be used in this setting, uh, you know, based on data and also based on clinical and scientific rationale. Um, from preclinical studies. So, you know, long story short, I think we're looking at all different avenues in how to best deal with the situation, knowing that it's very, very difficult for our patients and their family members. Um, we have lobbied uh, as AUA and also as Moffitt Cancer Center um, for uh, Merck to, to ramp up their productions. But of course, we know that that's probably not going to happen um, all the way up to speed for another three to five years. Um, and so in this interim, you know, we're not only sort of revising our um, prioritization schema, but also to develop hopefully new, newer drugs and more effective drugs than BCG. Thank you, Dr. Lee. It's a question for Dr. Mangli. Uh, the patient is taking Cabometis, Cabometis 440 milligrams for kidney cancer. Um, he's asking how effective is this drug in your experience? So cabozantinib or catamedix uh, is very much an active drug in kidney cancer. So it's, uh, it's a little bit hard, you know, in not just this question, but many of the questions you see coming up, you know, the context matters a lot. So as much as we can give you some information here, certainly encourage, like we said, reach out to your doctors. If you're a patient here, you have somebody. So encourage these questions to take them to your treating physician because context matters. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors that come into how effective a drug is. Is it the first drug you've ever been on or are you on second or third line, right? Is it in combination with other drugs or did you have toxicity to other drugs? What, what's the burden of disease, right? Um, I think the short answer is Cabomedics is very much effective. It, it, it's hard to tell you how effective um, without knowing some of those details, but it, it's certainly an active drug, especially 
in patients who have more of the non-clear cell uh, variants, uh, which is uh, ra rarer than the clear cell, so about 25%. It's, it's actually our first line drug uh, because it's really been proven in the last uh, couple of years uh, to be the most effective in that regard. But it is also something we use in the clear cell setting as well, especially if patients have already gone through some immunotherapy regimens. Um, but if it's working for you, then usually we keep it on it. One of the big problems we have in kidney cancer, and again, some of our studies I didn't get to share, is, is trying to sequence these drug regimens best as we can. We know some patients they work better for uh, versus others. And some patients, it's not uncommon in kidney cancer for patients to go through three or four different regimens, right? But if we could identify the right regimen for the first time, then certainly that would be ideal. Um, but it's, it's very complex to try and figure it out. And getting back to that you know, study I mentioned, when we look at the immune and host interactions, is there some identification that gives us that says, hey, this kind of interaction, whatever phenotype uh, or profile is really ideal for this drug combination, then that allows us to do, you know, more what we call precision medicine instead of just trying things at random. Thank you, Randall. There's another question for you. Uh, the patient uh, asks uh, that, has a tumor diagnosed uh, at Moffitt uh, that has been dormant for the last three years, I assume it's a kidney mass, a small kidney mass. It has not increased in size. Uh, the question is, is there any medication I should take to shrink or cancel the tumor? What is your suggestion? So again, if you're a patient at Moffitt, please talk to your Moffitt doctors. Uh, if it's me especially, then just please, you can get a hold of me. But uh, so, you know, again, without the, the full information, it's hard to, to know exactly what tumor you're talking about. So we know there are benign tumors of the kidney, um, and that may be one reason why it's not growing. Although we know tumors of the kidney can stay sort of dormant, like you're saying, for a period of time. And that's where we talk about things like active surveillance, because a lot of times, especially if they're small and localized, so our window to cure you, we don't think is going to be missed. We try and let the tumor tell us what's going to happen, because any treatment, whether it's surgery or systemic treatments comes with risk. And so we don't want to incur those risks unless we think the benefit is there or surpasses that. Um, I think the short answer is if you don't know exactly what it is, getting a biopsy, if it's not very cystic or fluid is always an easy way to sort of help mitigate what the next step should be. Uh, unfortunately, without that information, we don't really know what to help to shrink it. And the bigger question is, do you need to shrink it, right? Is it cancer? Um, if it's been stable for three years, that's a really good sign um, in kidney cancer. Uh, again, it's not a guarantee, but it's a really good sign. So, you know, it may be either worthwhile getting a biopsy or just continue with the surveillance because the treatment for those kind of drugs are pretty toxic. They're not something we give sort of willy nilly to patients because they can cause some serious side effects. Thank you, Dr. Mangli. A question for Dr. Lee. Um, there's a, a patient, 82 year old with a planned removal of the kidney, bladder, and prostate. Uh, and the other kidney has already been removed. Um, would chemotherapy be a recommendation after all this is done? Yes, so you know, depending on the disease stage, um, certainly in this case where you're gonna be rendered um, without a, any kidney function after the surgery, um, you would strongly consider having chemotherapy on board first prior to the surgical procedure. And that's because, you know, up to 50% of the time in muscle invasive bladder cancer or um, upper tract urothelial cancer, there are what's called micrometastatic disease or cancer cells that may have spread beyond the bladder and the kidney. So it's important for us to eliminate those uh, cancer cells first with chemotherapy prior to going to the um, so surgery to remove the bladder and the kidney. Um, there's a question, and either of you can take it. Uh, is there any association between kidney and bladder cancer? Not that I'm aware of, um, but certainly we're beginning to, you know, understand just the, the genomics behind cancer and also some of the impact of germline mutations. So, you know, mutations that you're born with at birth um, that can, uh, you know, have an impact on the chances of you developing cancer later on in life. Um, so I should also um, qualify by saying that this is kidney 
cancer of the parenchyma of the kidney. So, you know, the renal cell carcinomas uh, that, um, you know, we, we, we're talking about on the rind of the kidney, so to speak. There's also kidney cancer that happens within the funnel of the kidney where the urine is drained from the kidney down the, the tube into the bladder. And um, certainly cancer that arises from the funnel of the kidney um, share many characteristics that are very similar to bladder cancer. Thank you, Dr. Lee. A question for Dr. Mangli. Uh, what is the recurrence rate of kidney cancer? Uh, the patient had chromophobe, uh, chromophobe renal cell carcinoma four years ago, uh, and the kidney was removed at Mafet, at Mafet actually. So uh, when it comes to recurrence risk, so if you're dealing with tumors that are localized, meaning you haven't spread throughout the kidney, the biggest predictor we have right now is the stage. So without knowing the stage, it's a little bit hard to, to give you anything more specific. But again, if you have a physician here at Moffitt, reach out to him. Um, so, but we in, even independent of stage, so stage for stage, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four is means it's already spread. So stage one, two, and three, chromophobe, across the board is uh, much less likely to recur than the clear cell variant, which is much more common or some of the other rare variants like papillary and stuff like that. So being four years out from chromophobe is a very good sign. Um, again, without knowing the stage, it's hard to say, but um, the recurrence risk, you know, if you were in the stage one, stage two and had chromophobe and had it completely resected, be disease-free, you know, the risk of recurrence is probably under 5%, 3% maybe. Thank you. Question for Dr. Lee. Uh, the patient had a reaction to BCG and uh, can no longer receive this treatment. Um, what else do you recommend to ward off uh, the recurrence of uh, bladder cancer? So great question. Um, I think in this case, it really depends on whether or not there is recurrence of cancer. Um, I don't think that there is any benefit in switching the type of therapy from BCG to, for example, maintenance chemotherapy uh, if there is no cancer recurrence. But if there is cancer recurrence after this inadequate BCG treatment, certainly we can use intravesical chemotherapy or other you know, um, agents that we use in the clinical trial setting sometimes to, to uh, ward off the recurrence of cancer. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, just a reminder, great questions. Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, in, in case we don't get to all the questions, uh, um, we have a monologue and we'll get back to you if uh, time doesn't allow. Uh, let me go back to the questions. Um, we really appreciate your wonderful questions. Uh, and I'm impressed. Uh, I just counted and we have probably close to 100 questions. Uh, Dr. Lee, is suspicious urine cytology the same as atypia? Not at all. Um, so that's actually a, a very great question and a common question. So atypical cytology is much more common than suspicious uh, uh, urine cytology. Um, so atypical urine cytology can happen basically just uh, by many different uh, ways. And it's by no means any diagnosis of cancer or even that there is a possibility of cancer. Um, in fact, we see this all the time in the setting of inflammation, of infection, of um, you know, urinary tract stones. We can see typical cells. Um, so unless it's specifically deemed to be suspicious for carcinoma, or if there's any carcinoma cells that were found, um, it's considered to be a negative test. So you don't have to do anything for atypical urine cytology. Thank you. Another question for you, Dr. Lee. Uh, the patient had a pelvic exenteration uh, with a, a urine a conduit uh, for squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. And uh, the pathology showed clear margins. There were no lymph nodes involved. And it's awaiting a follow-up appointment um, any recommendation regarding clinical trials uh, or following up with radiation therapy? So um, squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder is, uh, behaves very differently than urothelial cancer. 
And one thing that we've learned over the years is that it doesn't respond as well to the standard chemotherapy uh, regimen that we give, which is typically cisplatin based. So I think in the setting of um, squamous cell carcinoma that was removed, um, you know, we really do think that this is more of a local uh, event than a cancer process that actually would invade through the, uh, the lymphatic system or the vascular system. So as long as the tumor within the, the pelvis is completely removed, which it sounds like it is in this case, then um, you know, just sit tight and um, uh, cross our fingers that it doesn't come back. I don't think there's any indication for any additional treatment. Thank you. Question for Dr. Mangli. Uh, you mentioned uh, this uh, adaptive uh, therapy and uh, what is the determinant factor for the doctors su to suggest taking a break from a uh, treatment? Well, uh, right now in current practice, the, the biggest factor is toxicity. So if patients are having really bad toxicities from these agents, sometimes we're not, we're forced to, to stop treatment uh, because, you know, the goal of treatment is to make life better and longer not make life worse and longer. Um, so, you know, there's different levels of that toxicity. Again, that's something you have to work with. Some of the, the, the side effects are tolerable, at least for some period of time. And, and sometimes patients make their own decisions and have every right to do that. You know, the, the way that this trial is novel is that we're looking for a better way than just, okay, let's wait until the patients get so sick or weak to stop the medicine. Maybe we can stop it before that happens. And maybe because of the evolution of how cancer cells divide and compete for the same environment, space, and nutrients, we can leverage that against themselves for sort of a win-win in that scenario. So we don't do that right now. That's why this is a new trial. That's why it's a clinical trial. We need to study it to see if it, it's one, effective, two, safe, and, and all of those key questions. But as it stands right now and in, in every day, the only time we really do a holiday is either one, when a patient tells, I don't wanna do this anymore, or two, we sort of have to have a, a frank conversation that listen, these side effects, which usually at that time we're having that conversation, I mean, they're pretty serious, are gonna ne necessitate we either take a break from this regimen or we switch it to a different one. Thank you. Question for Dr. Lee, uh, popularly, uh, bladder cancer, T0, meaning that only in the surface or T1 underneath the surface, uh, what are the recurrence rates for this type of tumor, Dr. Lee? So, um, you know, bladder cancer is actually the most expensive um, cancer in terms of management. And the reason for that is because even for these low grade or low stage bladder tumors, they have a very high tendency for recurrence. And typically even for the, these ones in the TA or the T1 stage, um, we see upwards of 50% or more uh, recurrence. And actually one of the projects that we're looking at here at Moffitt is uh, you know, having two cohorts of patients. In one, you have the same tumor, low-grade TA tumor that are resected. And we know by following these patients that they do not have a recurrence over the years of their follow-up here at Moffitt. And then in the other, they have multiple recurrences, sometimes you know, upwards of more than 10 or a dozen recurrences. And you can imagine how um, you know, life-altering that experience would be, uh, just having so many different resections. And we're looking at it from a couple of different angles. So we're, one thing that we're looking at is actually the histologic slides to see if there is any nuances in the histology that can predict whether or not a patient's gonna have recurrence. Second of all, we're also profiling these tumors from a genomic standpoint to see what type of mutations are found in each group of those tumors um, to see whether there's any mutations that can predict whether a patient's going to have recurrence or not. So, you know, again, also very, very excited about the results um, from those studies. And hopefully we'll be able to one day tell a patient after they first have a bladder tumor diagnosed, whether or not they're going to have a recurrence and whether or not they, they'll need to have any additional follow-up or not. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Question for Dr. Mangli. Uh, does pembrolizumab work in post-nephrectomy kidney cancer? 
Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, it depends on your histology a little bit, but like I mentioned earlier, recently uh, a trial was completed the first of its kind looking at pembrolizumab specifically in the adjuvant setting. And it was a positive trial and, and therefore the FDA approved that medication. There are other trials that are currently underway and, and nearing completion. So we may soon have more than one agent. So the, the answer is yes, it works. The question is, does everybody need to get it? Um, and that's a harder question to answer. And so again, by maybe identifying patients who we think are at the highest risk of recurrence and then giving them the drug, because the drug's not benign by any means, um, may allow us again to, to more selectively treat patients who need it the most. Thank you. Uh, there was a question for Dr. Lee regarding the oncolytic virus. Is that given intravenously or into the bladder directly? So it is given just within the bladder, uh, much like BCG. And because of that, it actually causes much less toxicity than your systemic agent. Um, and so, you know, mainly uh, patients complain about bladder related spasms, sometimes uh, seeing some blood with either with a catheterization or because of the treatment itself. But, you know, that's one of the uh, market advantages that we've seen from this drug combination is how tolerable it, it is. And it makes a, a huge difference because, you know, in the setting of muscle invasive bladder cancer, the next step is actually to remove the bladder, at least for now. Um, that's the, the, the treatment paradigm. And so it behooves us to get the patients quickly to that procedure so that we can, you know, see whether there's any cancer left in their bladder. And if you give a patient a chemotherapeutic agent that's very toxic, oftentimes we have to wait upwards of about a month or longer uh, for the patient to recover from the toxicity of the chemotherapy in order to do that procedure. Thank you, Dr. Lee. A question for Dr. Mangli. Uh, I'm presently on Enlira and Keytruda for kidney cancer. At this time, the tumors described are undetectable, but it's ha having major problems with the feet uh, with this regimen. Is there a different regimen that may be easier on the hands and the feet? Yeah, so you're on pembrolizumab and exitinib is the, the generic name for that. So that class of drugs, exitinib, the targeted therapies have a very classic syndrome called hand foot mouth syndrome. Um, and as you can tell, the foot is included in that. And so patients can get a lot of pain, blister, soreness in their extremities. And it is one of the rate limiting toxicities. It's certainly good that it appears you've responded well. Um, and so that drug, ex, ex, exitinib, can actually be adjusted. There's the five milligram, three milligram, one milligram. And a lot of times when we're talking about adjusting things, that's the first thing that usually gets adjusted, especially if you can pinpoint the side effect, which I think in your case, you sort of can. So talk about either decreasing the dose to continue to have what appears to be a good response. Or like I mentioned before, there may be a point where you say, hey, listen, I'm doing very well. Why don't I stop it and see how things go? Again, that's not the standard of care right now, Right. But it is something that in clinical practice we see done all the time because we're limited by toxicities. But there may be a point where we can do this on a more, you know, a more uh, objective manner instead of just waiting for patients to present with side effects. So I think it's certainly attributed to the enlighter or exitinib. Um, and so either decreasing the dose or holding that dose and continuing the pembrolizumab may be an option or switching to another regimen completely. Thank you. Another question for you, Dr. Mangli, are there statistics for survival in total loss of kidney function and then uh, going on dialysis in an elderly patient? Yes, there's very good statistics. So Kaiser, which is a large hospital system in California, did a pretty elegant study quite some years ago, and there's been studies since, but it's sort of the, the first one that looked at a very large population because they had, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients, and they showed pretty well that you know, when you lose a kidney, whether it's because somebody took it out for cancer or a car accident or, or whatever it is, when you lose that, especially as you get older, it's a harder hit on the system. And so patients are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease in addition to things like needing dialysis. And so, again, one of the things we try and do here on the surgical side is only take the part of the kidney that has the tumor. Um, and sometimes that's not easy. It can be complex. And so it's always easier, actually, to take the whole kidney than it is to... Um, to take just part of the kidney. Now, sometimes that's not feasible because of the mass itself or the reconstruction. So there's a lot of things that go into it, but 
we know that taking kidneys out doesn't do patients good in the long run. Again, this is a battle we have to play with cancer versus other comorbidities, um, but it, it's well known. But things you can do afterwards, and patients always ask, can I eat something different or change my diet? And the answer is yes, in that the things that make your heart healthy, your lungs healthy, decrease your weight, keep your blood pressure under control, those are things that are good for your whole body, and they're really good for your kidneys, um, especially if you only have one. Thank you. Well, we're at the hour, so I want to thank uh, Dr. Mangli and Dr. Lee for those wonderful presentations and teach us a lot about these two uh, conditions. I uh, also wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, David uh, Curry and Stacy Price for putting this together. Again, uh, we'll look at your questions. So we have your contact information, so we'll get back to you to try to answer as many questions as possible. So thank you very much for joining us. Good night.